Hi everyone, welcome to the 2022 edition of Poznań Festival of Science and Art. My name is Cornelia Boczkowska and I work at the Faculty of English at Adamskiewicz University. Uh, I have a great pleasure today to talk to you about slow cinema through the lens of experimental filmmakers. So uh, thanks for being here with me and I hope you will enjoy my talk. So we're going to start with a simple question. Uh, I'll try to explain to you what slow cinema is. Uh, so is it an official movement in filmmaking? Uh, that can be encountered in mainstream cinema or independent cinema or art cinema or uh, experimental cinema? Uh, is it a production trend um, defined by a, a relatively fixed or stable set of conventions concerning the use of the narrative and editing and montage? Is it a one of cycle or is it a long lasting tradition? So one of those persistent trends that is going to prevail uh, for a longer period of time. So one of the most straightforward definitions of slow cinema uh, that you can come across if you look this term up is that it's a distinctive uh, aesthetic trend within art cinema that surfaced during the 2000s. Uh, so it's not necessarily um, a genre uh, per se, um, because slow cinema actually transcends um, different genres and different generic uh, conventions and can be encountered in various films representing various genres, including uh, science fiction films, uh, drama films, or even horror films, uh, not to mention um, uh, nature films or rico films. In 2012, Matthew Flanagan defended his PhD dissertation at the University of Exeter, and it was actually the first book-length study of slow cinema in which slow cinema was defined as a stylistic current within contemporary art and experimental film that privileges a number of distinct and recognizable tropes, including the application of the long take, an anti-dramatic narrative on the narrative structure, a tendency toward realist or hyper-realist representation, and a pronounced stillness of composition and visual content. In his dissertation, Flanagan um, traces the evolution of slow cinema over the course of the last three decades, but if you look at the history of slow cinema, you will um, notice that the first film that can be identified with the slow cinema aesthetics were made as early as in the mid 1960s. So in his dissertation, Flanagan <clears throat> also proposes that the slow cinema aesthetics can be applied to many uh, post 1960s avant-garde experimental and realist documentary films that will be our focus today, by the way. Um, and um, in his work, he either mentions uh, or discusses in detail the work of such filmmakers as Chantal Ackerman, uh, James Benning, or Peter Hatton, among others. And today I will also focus on uh, discussing the work of some of these filmmakers. So in the popular imagination, slow cinema is uh, associated with the quality of slowness or the widely defined slow movement, which is now becoming a global trend with slowness initiatives uh, spreading worldwide. So by definition, slow movement is, um, is again a global trend uh, that advocates a cultural shift uh, towards slowing down the pace of one's life. It originated in the mid-1980s in Europe, and it's all about um, slow living, okay? So it's a, it's a specific type of, mind, of mindset, and it's about doing everything at the right speed. Um, and in cinema, um, slowness um, also takes various forms, but on the other hand, uh, it can be associated with roughly the same uh, qualities, including minimalism uh, or the minimalist aesthetics, um, observational and contemplative practice or viewing experience, and this kind of aesthetics is usually conveyed through the use of long takes. So this is something that many slow films actually share or, ha or, or have in common. And in doing so, slow films uh, clearly oppose many mainstream fast-paced and commercial cinema productions, particularly those made by some major Hollywood studios. And today, uh, uh, slow cinema is becoming more and more popular, and, um, and not only in art cinema, but also in experimental cinema. Uh, this is evident in the rise of the Slow Film Festival, which was originally founded in 2016 in Mayfield, East Sussex, in England. Uh, it became a UK charity in 2018, 
and today uh, it screens art and experimental films every year to the British public, and not only to the British public, but also to some extent to the international public, and in doing so it celebrates the slow cinema traditions, uh, tradition in its various forms and uh, dimensions. So as I mentioned, um, the first films that can be uh, quite clearly identified with the slow cinema aesthetics uh, came out in the mid 1960s uh, uh, with the rise of the French New Wave. So the first film that you can see in this list is called Balthazar at Random. At least this is the English translation of this, uh, of this French title. And uh, it's a French drama film, which tells the story of a donkey uh, that is passed from one owner to another owner, most of whom treat him callously. So this is a very sad story. Not only is this film slow, but it's also very sad and it resonates well with uh, animal studies as it makes a donkey its uh, protagonist and also makes the viewer uh, very, very strongly um, um, identify uh, with, uh, with, with the titular character. So as you can see, um, this trend continues well into the 1970s and then resurfaces after 2000 in the new millennium uh, when even more slow movies were made and became uh, sort of exemplary of the slow cinema tradition. And these films include Uncle Bunmi, who can recall his past lives, Elephant, Evolution of a Filipino Family, The Turin Horse, or uh, First Cow. Uh, and uh, one of the first experimental films uh, that uh, fits well into the slow cinema tradition uh, was made uh, by Chantal Ackerman in 1975. Uh, this is Jean Dillman, and uh, the remaining part of the title uh, stands for the exact address where a heroine uh, lives at. And um, for those of you who are not really familiar with Chantal Ackerman's work, uh, Ackerman was a Belgian filmmaker and artist. Uh, she also taught at the City College of New York, and uh, she's best known uh, for Jean Dillman, uh, that I will briefly discuss with you today. Um, in her lifetime, she made uh, several uh, films uh, that um, exerted a huge influence on the history and development of feminist and avant-garde uh, cinema. And we can generally say that Ackerman's uh, work um, had a really substantial uh, influence on um, feminist, uh, on the feminist experimental film. Uh, and Jean Dillman is also considered the masterpiece of the feminine and feminist uh, cinema Today, it's recognized as a cult classic. It tells the story of a single mother's daily life. Uh, so uh, Ackerman's camera literally uh, captures uh, the heroines, who's Jean Dillman, right? Jean Dillman's uh, performing uh, a number of daily chores, including cooking, cleaning, mothering. She also happens to be a mother to an adolescent boy. And Jean Dillman also has sex with male clients to make ends uh, meet. But interestingly, her sex work is uh, not necessarily depicted as something controversial or extraordinary or taboo. It's simply presented as part of her daily routine, which is largely uneventful, right? Actually, her life is pretty boring and it's unadventurous. Um, in, until some point, okay, that I don't really want to reveal to you. Um, so uh, let me show you a short trailer of this film so that you can get an idea of, you know, what it looks like and also how slow it gets.
So the reason why I mentioned this film is um, that uh, it's a mesmerizing study of stasis uh, and containment, time and domestic anxiety, um, and um, and uh, it documents the heroine's daily household routine in long stock takes. So this is exactly what makes it um, a exemplary of the slow cinema tradition. Um, the film um, definitely, or this kind of editing and montage definitely emphasizes duration and andromatic uh, narration that nevertheless results in the climax, okay? Again, I don't really want to reveal to you what happens on the third day uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Jean Dillman's life, uh, but I do encourage you to have a look at this film in your free time, especially if you're interested in feminist cinema or avant-garde cinema. So let me just sum up. Uh, slow cinema can be characterized by a set of uh, very distinctive uh, conventions. Uh, and some of these conventions um, um, are um, considered the use of dialogue and sound and uh, camera movement, etc. So uh, most slow films that you will see uh, contain no dialogue or very, very little dialogue, okay? For instance, in Jean Dillman, there is no dialogue at all, uh, but in, um, in uh, Andrei Tarkovsky's uh, Stalker, okay, there is very little dialogue, but still dialogue exists, okay? So it really differs uh, depending, uh, uh, depending on what film we see, okay? Uh, there is little camera movement involved, so oftentimes uh, slow films are simply composed of a series of, uh, of, of static and fixed shots. Um, slow films that contain some sort of narrative um, do it in a very specific way, okay? The narrative uh, that we can follow in slow films, especially in slow feature films, is andromatic and oblique, and it, uh, it's oftentimes told in real time, which highlights, again, uh, duration, okay, and our experience of uh, time as is, okay. This kind of aesthetics is, as I mentioned on a number of occasions, expressed through the use of a very common and prevalent use of long takes, okay, including attenuated takes, long tracking or panning shots, often of depopulated landscapes, uh, prolonged handheld follow shots of solo people walking, right? And, and uh, the, last, uh, uh, the last convention is uh, particularly uh, typical uh, for the so-called walking films, okay? So here you can think about Gus Van Sant's uh, uh, walking films, uh, including Jerry uh, or Elephant. So when it comes to sound, um, there is usually um, a minimal soundtrack involved, right? So in other words, the soundtrack is kept to a minimum, okay? Or there is no soundtrack at all, okay? Except for, uh, for some diegetic sounds, okay? Diegetic sounds usually come uh, solely from, from the natural surroundings. And sometimes, um, the soundtrack is uh, composed only of some background or ambient noise rather than the actual music. And many slow films are also realistic, highly realistic actually, or hyper-realistic. And what makes them so realistic is that again, the narrative is often told in real time, okay? So it places us like directly, okay, into, uh, into the narrative and into the characters um, so that we can experience whatever they experience, right? Um, uh, at exactly the same time they experience it. And um, also the question of duration is quite interesting. Okay, so as I already mentioned, uh, the slow cinema aesthetics is usually expressed uh, through long takes, okay? 
In an average slow film, one shot can last over two minutes. Okay, so this is really long. Okay, let us have a look at Stalker. Okay, so Andrei Tarkovsky's uh, Stalker from 1979 contains 142 shots in 163 minutes, with an average shot length of more than one minute and many shots lasting for more than four minutes, okay? One of the longest sequences that you can encounter when watching Stalker is the rain scene, okay? So if this scene actually occurs in the latter part of the film, and this scene lasts over two and a half uh, minutes, if I remember correctly. So this makes striking contrast to many Hollywood productions in which um, it, there are over 20 shots or cuts within only two minutes, okay? And in some fast paced Hollywood productions, we can observe as many as 100 shots or cuts within only two minutes, okay? This is how big this contrast is here in terms of an average shot length, okay? Um, so again, to give you a different perspective, an average film has an average shot length of around eight seconds, but in some extremely fast paced Hollywood productions, okay? An average shot length can last only around two seconds, okay? This is how fast these productions uh, really are, okay? Some examples here include uh, Mad Max, obviously, right? Uh, Fury Road, uh, Resident Evil Apocalypse, Taken 3, or Domino. Okay, so now I would like to discuss uh, two films with you in more detail, and um, these are actually two experimental films. Uh, the first one is Nightfall by James Benning from 2012, and the second one is Large Break uh, by Sharon Lockhead from 2008. And I will try to demonstrate to you uh, that both of these films uh, take the slow cinema aesthetics to the extreme, okay? So the films that, are, that you're about to see are not only slow, they're going to be extremely slow, okay? So they're going to test your patience as members of the audience. So again, the first film that I'm gonna discuss with you is called Nightfall by James Benning from 2012. It's a digital color and sound film, uh, which is considerably long for an experimental film because it lasts 98 minutes. Uh, so um, James Benning um, was born in 1942 in Milwaukee in Wisconsin. Uh, according to Scott McDonald, uh, he can be considered a veteran independent filmmaker and a master of 16 mirror landscape films. Uh, in um, 2007, uh, Benning made a film called RR, and the release of this film has actually marked his transition from uh, 16 mirror filmmaking to digital filmmaking, right? So today, James Benning is mostly involved in digital um, filmmaking. Since 1971, uh, uh, he has made uh, over 60 experimental films and over 25 feature length films, okay? So uh, um, his experimental films are usually shorter, right, than his uh, feature length films. Um, he uh, has earned his reputation for his life, lifelong commitment to exploring American Midwestern and West, Western landscapes. And that's why he's often referred to as a master of 16 mirror landscape films. And most of his works can be characterized by minimalist aesthetics, prolonged shots, and a rigorous form of structure, okay? Sometimes the structure of his films it can be considered even mathematical, right? Very meticulous, very precise, okay? And this kind of aesthetics uh, is oftentimes expressed uh, through a series of fixed, stable, and extended shots. Uh, his works uh, basically mirror um, his um, major um, philosophical stance, which is uh, mostly about landscape as a function of time and looking and listening. When teaching at CalArts, uh, James Benning even developed a course called Looking and Listening. 
okay? And um, his uh, philosophical ideas that he incorporates into his filmmaking are largely inspired by Henry David Thoreau's uh, Walden Residence to Civil Government and uh, Fyodor uh, Kaczynski's Mathematical Theories. Uh, his legacy uh, is considered to be central for both the 1970s structuralism and the 1980s new, new narrative movement. So uh, many of his works actually function as kind of transitional. Uh, so, uh, so on the one hand, uh, they combine some structural devices and formal qualities um, of the film medium. Uh, with uh, a range of social, political, or historical themes. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some scholars uh, again consider um, James Benning's uh, work as historiographical documentaries, and this is what makes them like pretty close to the 1980s new narrative movement. So um, let me move to Nightfall. And here I'm going to look at two questions. Okay, first of all, I'm going to explain to you where exactly this film takes place. And secondly, I'm going to explain to you what exactly happens in this film. Okay, so the film was shot <clears throat> at a high elevation in the woods in the, in the West Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, and um, the film is entirely composed of a single 98 minute shot that begins in late afternoon as the sun is going down and ends in near blackness, okay? So um, in this film, the audience is exposed only to one single setting, okay? And um, this setting is um, a small area within the woods in the West Sierra Nevada mountains in California. And this is only, um, again, one single setting that viewers are supposed to look at, to observe, to dwell upon, to contemplate, okay? What is worse, there is no even single movement or animal presence. Um, this is something that we are not able to detect in this film. Both are actually audible on the soundtrack, which is composed only of diegetic sounds. So again, sounds that come entirely from the surroundings, okay, from the natural surroundings in this case. So what we can also hear on the soundtrack is the bird song, okay, that gradually yields to the susurrant or overwhelming from of myriad of myriad, myriad I'm sorry, insects, okay. So there is this kind of transition from the bird song to the insect song, I guess, okay which is really interesting because again, it places us directly, okay, into the narrative, okay? We, we can really feel uh, part, of, uh, part of the entire setting. So uh, now the question is, if so little happens in this film, right? Um, what are we supposed to focus on, okay? And uh, what is the focus of this film, okay? So the focus of this film is the only element that actually changes, which is a real-time light that changes from day to night, okay? This is the focus of the film. So with this changing light, the film is purely meditative, okay? It works uh, like a relaxation on nature videos uh, that you can encounter on YouTube, okay? Uh, Again, to give you an idea what it looks like, I would like to uh, show you um, a few clips from this film. This is actually uh, my own montage of, uh, of a few scenes uh, from James Benning's film. Um, and uh, this is a 12 minute clip from the film, um, which I edited myself to show you the actual transition uh, from day to night, okay? Uh, so uh, in other words, to show you the changing light that happens to be the focus of the film. Uh, so um, probably we, we won't have time to see the entire clip, okay? So I'm gonna, you know, skip, right? Some, uh, some short excerpts of this video, uh, but nevertheless, uh, let us see again what it looks like and what it feels like.
Um, so this is the point where the soundtrack changes, okay? So instead of a bird song, we can hear uh, the insect song. So let me move a little bit forward, okay, up to the point when light changes to almost complete darkness. Okay, um, so I think we can actually pause right here, okay? And uh, some of you uh, may ask a question, okay, if nothing happens, okay, um, then what's the point, okay? What's the point of the whole film? Um, it's kind of, it's okay, it's meditative, it's contemplative, but on the other hand, it's a bit boring in it, okay? Um, well, actually, there is some point, okay? First of all, it's, um, it's, it's an extreme form of the so-called pure and radical slow cinema, okay? So it fits uh, well into the slow cinema tradition because it really tests our patience. It um, tests our attention, okay? Or uh, um, it engages us in the practice of looking and listening it invites the haptic gaze and um, haptic looking. Uh, and interestingly, uh, the nightfall does not show up until the last act when it completely takes over the image, okay? So in a way, uh, the film actually provides us with some sort of climax or resolution, okay? And, um, it's also obsessed with capturing uh, the light in a way that many landscape painters, right, were obsessed uh, with uh, with capturing, you know, real real life uh, light in their paintings. Okay, uh, so uh, what does the viewer do? Okay, especially the viewer. 
okay, whose attention is restricted to merely one setting, okay? So first of all, we scan the image, okay? And uh, we have no other option, right? Because um, this is the only image that we get, okay? So in this way, James Benning actually encourages us, right, to focus our attention entirely on one single image and to scan every detail of it, okay? To soak up every element of the frame, okay? So the longer we look at this image, right, the more we explore the relationship between the moving and still image and light, okay? And in doing so, we can ponder the elusiveness of time, okay? We can experience real, real time in an almost physical way, okay? Um, and we can feel as if we are able to to touch the image, okay? So in this way, Nightfall really invites uh, the haptic look, okay? Which is based on the reciprocal relationship between viewer and the image, okay? So we can almost physically feel the materiality of the film medium, right? But also the filmmaker himself can reach out to us through the image, okay? So this is this kind of reciprocal relationship that we are involved in, okay? Um, and obviously the film is extremely slow, okay? So it really works a little bit like, you know, a, a, a film installation or a nature video or a relaxation video. Okay, the next film that I'd like to discuss with you is called Lunch Break by Sharon Lockhart from 2008. And this is a 35 millimeter film um, transferred to HD. It's a color and sound film. And just like Nightfall, it's also considerably long, especially for an experimental film because it lasts 83 minutes. And before I move to my discussion of the film itself, I'd like to say a few words about Sharon Lockhart, especially for those of you not really familiar with her work. So Sharon Lockhart was born in 1964 in Norwood, Massachusetts. Uh, she's uh, trained as a photographer and filmmaker. Uh, currently she's based in LA, California, but she also spent some time in Poland where she developed a few uh, projects. Up to date, uh, she has made 12 films. And all of these films can be situated uh, at the intersection of visual anthropology, ethnographic film, and personal documentary. And also a lot of her films are seen as, um, as slow films. And uh, her work um, is um, uh, greatly inspired by uh, structuralism and also by James Benning's uh, work. Uh, so, Structuralism uh, was a distinctive film movement uh, which emerged in the 1970s in the UK and US. And for, uh, for structural filmmakers, the shape and structure of the film was crucial, right? Whereas the content of the film was usually peripheral, okay? So in structural films, we are supposed to focus again on the, on the shape of the, of the film and also on the formal uh, qualities uh, or mechanical qualities of the film medium rather than the, the, the narrative content of the film, right? So what happens on screen is not that important, okay? So uh, some of her works can be characterized by the lack of narration, uh, a very strong preoccupation with uh, cinematic space and time or film performance, and also formal qualities of the film medium or the materiality of the film medium. So as I mentioned, um, in her professional career, Sharon Lockhart um, has uh, certain links to Poland. Uh, in, 20, uh, in 2017, Lockhart was chosen to be included in the Polish pavilion at the uh, Venice Biennale for her project, Little Review, which was based on children's popular magazine published in the 1920s and uh, 30s. Uh, in Poland, Little Review was actually created with young women from the Youth Social Therapy Center in Rijenko, and it provides 
a forum for children's voices. Uh, this work was inspired by the work of Janusz Korczak, the Polish Jewish educator, orphanage director and children's rights advocate. Uh, she also developed a few other projects in Poland, in, including Podwórka in 2009. Uh, Podwórka is a very evocative um, and beautiful film, which documents uh, the courtyards of Łódź and the children that inhabit them. Okay, So it tells the story of how the courtyards uh, in Łódź are oftentimes um, converted um, into or turned into the playgrounds of the children that live in the surrounding apartment buildings. Um, she also made Antwa Milena in 2015 and Rujenko in 2016. So all of these works uh, were developed in Poland. And um, in many of her works, um, she is interested in um, exploring the conditions of childhood and uh, some overlooked communities, including, um, including workers or people coming from, uh, from the working class background. She herself actually comes from the working class background. And uh, in her film, uh, Milena from 2015, um, she um, celebrated uh, her long-term work and uh, friendship uh, with uh, Milena uh, that she befriended in 2006 when filming Otvurka. Uh, so um, during this time from 2009 to 2015, she basically observed a small girl's maturation into an adolescent young adult. Um, so this uh, film is a recreation or reenactment re of an iconic sequence from François Truffaut's 1959 film, The 400 Blows, and it stars Milena, her longtime friend. Okay, so let me move to lunch break. So again, I'm going to focus here on two different questions. First of all, where it takes place and secondly what exactly happens in this film okay so uh the film was shot at bath isle works shipyard in bath maine this is um in the state of maine right and this is maine's uh, major shipbuilding factory uh the projects uh, the project developed uh from lockhart's personal connections to the state and in order to uh, to film um, to film it, uh, she spent approximately one year on the shipyard's premises, where she observed and uh, interviewed workers during daily shifts. Okay, uh, so again, uh, this uh, uh, this film stems from uh, from from her connections uh, to. Uh, the factory's community and also from her working class background and also for, from her personal interest uh, in again documenting uh, the life and work of some overlooked communities. Okay, so what exactly happens in this film? So uh, Lockhead's camera captures 42 shipbuilders and workers as they take their midday break. Okay, so we can see them reading, sleeping, talking, or finally eating. Okay, and uh, what happens here is that the camera slowly moves down the corridor lined with lockers. Okay, so again, we are presented, right, solely with uh, one single setting, which is a long corridor, right, lined with lockers. Okay and also filled with various people, various workers who engage in different activities uh, during their uh, lunch break. Uh, so in other words, just like in Nightfall, our viewing perspective is kind of restricted. Uh, the hallway emerges here as an industrial and social nexus. Uh, so the film is kind of more telling, okay, because it exposes us to many different details uh, concerning uh, the whole ritual of taking uh, lunch break at this particular factory, 
The soundtrack is also quite interesting. In contrast to Nightfall, it's actually not composed of diegetic sounds solely. Uh, the soundtrack um, was made in collaboration with Becky Allen and James Bedding, and it's composed of industrial sounds, music, and voices, okay? Although sometimes it really feels as, as if it was only composed of diegetic sounds, but it's only an impression that we get. According to Locker himself, the film is supposed to serve as an extended mediation on a moment of respite from productive labor, okay? So in other words, uh, the film um, examines uh, the conditions, the present day conditions of um, labor, okay? And um, it also um, comments on the decline of the American industrial working class in the context of 21st century um, global capitalism. And the reason why Lockhart actually focused on documenting lunch break in this particular setting is that the lunch break is actually rapidly disappearing from the present day American workplace, okay? And so is uh, the work, this particular um, working class community that Lockhart uh, focuses on, okay? So in this film, the lunch break is presented not necessarily uh, as a simple activity that workers engage in uh, during their daily shift, but it's uh, depicted more as a social ritual, okay? And the slow cinema format encourages us to engage in the social ritual along with the workers uh, depicted on screen. Okay, so let me comment more on um, editing and montage because it, it's really interesting here. So the film is composed of a single continuous wide angle frontward tracking shot, which is digitally slowed down to three frames a second, okay? So it's extremely slow compared to 24 uh, frames per second, okay? Now the original uh, footage, the original 35 millimeter footage lasted 10 minutes, which is equivalent to a total of 14,400 frames. Uh, but in the post-production process, it was transferred to a high definition digital medium and every frame was copied eight times, uh, which resulted in the footage being uh, elongated, right? To 80 minutes, okay? Um, so in this way, we actually end up with a feature length film, okay, rather than a short experimental film. So what happens here again is that the camera moves along the Z axis of the frame, okay, the whole film, or the whole the, the entire image that we're exposed to is composed of vertical planes, okay. And uh, it's the whole scene is projected um, in slow motion or even extremely slow motion, we can say. And the use of extremely slow motion gives rise to certain optical illusions, okay? So depending whether one concentrates either on the center edges of the frame, the footage moves faster or slower, okay? This is the impression that we get, okay? So I'd like to show you a five minute uh, clip from this film. And uh, I'd like to encourage you to, to think, okay, if you can actually uh, experience these optical illusions, okay? And also if you, if you like the film, if you find it interesting or creative, okay? Uh, this clip is also uh, available on Sharon Lockhart's official website.
So again, the soundtrack that you can hear here in my case actually, it actually consists of uh, various uh, index of sounds uh, that uh, blend into the background. Uh, so the soundtrack along with the image uh, seem to be you know, very hypnotizing. So again, some of you may be thinking, okay, what's the point? Okay, what's the point of the entire film? It is so boring, okay? It's even more boring than Nightfall because not, it is extremely slow, okay? It's, it's slowed down to the point when we kind of, we lose touch, okay, with reality and we have no idea what's going on. Um, uh, we have no idea what we'll focus on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this film again is uh, almost exemplary of the slow cinema tradition, and it takes it to the extreme uh, in a similar manner as uh, Nightfall does. So, what makes this film slow is obviously the use of fixed camera position, so this long tracking shot, and also the use of extremely slow motion. Okay, so the use of these conventions and devices enable us to serve the mundane details of the worker's daily routine, which typically escape our attention, and also to partake, uh, to quote, partake in a unique kind of suspended mediation on this brief interval of free time in their daily work schedule, okay, according to Lopez. And, um, this is a citation, I think, from, from the catalog, um, which discusses uh, the film in greater detail, okay? So in other words, Sharon Lockhead uh, invites us to survey uh, certain details and elements of the surrounding reality that typically escape our attention, okay? Um, and uh, by in doing so, we are supposed to focus not only on duration, on the passing time, but also on the relationship between mundane routine and free and structured time, okay? And uh, we're supposed to celebrate um, 
the lunch break as a social ritual. Okay, the lunch the lunch break here is preserved as as a social ritual and also as an important part of the daily routine of the workers um, who are presented on screen. Okay, um, so um, it gives prominence to minimalism, but it also gives prominence to uh, to the present day American uh, workplace uh, that again uh, is oftentimes neglected and marginalized in mainstream uh, Hollywood productions or even in independent feature, uh, feature filmmaking. Okay, so let me wrap up. Um, I would like to um, to, to make a few observations uh, about slow cinema. As you could have noticed, um, many experimental films that um, are supposed to fit well into the slow cinema tradition in our cinema have certain things in common, okay? These things usually uh, consider the use of a narrative and also the use of editing and montage, okay? So what these films have in common is the use of slow motion, long tracking shots, long takes, and a fixed camera position, okay? So whenever you see some of these structural devices or conventions, you can be sure that you're dealing with a film that clearly seeks inspiration from the slow cinema aesthetics, okay? So now, all of these conventions have a very specific uh, purpose to serve, okay? They serve as a framing device for the whole film, okay? So in other words, they define the structure and the entire shape of a given film, right? They tell us to focus on how uh, the film was shot, okay? And how um, some particular conventions are executed um and um they tell us not necessarily to focus on the narrative content of of the image okay so in this way um films like this affect a visual and auditory as well as temporal spatial experience of time so what is really important for us here is again, not really to focus on whatever is happening on screen, but to focus on how we physically experience the passing time, okay? Uh, or the elusiveness of time and how we respond to the image, how we respond to the materiality of the film image, okay? How beautiful it gets or how telling it can be, okay? It, it places us in, in this thoughtful relationship to the image because even though some of these films can be considered boring or long or extremely slow, okay, um, there are still, um, they, they still have a message, okay? And it is our role to figure out what this message is. And lastly, these conventions amplify an emotional resonance of the imagery, okay? So again, we are supposed to emotionally respond to the image, okay? To respond to it on the level of emotions, of feelings, okay? So it links us, these conventions link us directly to the image in a kind of physical and emotional way. So it, it seems that uh, the slow cinema aesthetics manifests itself on the level of editing and narrative. And um, in terms of editing and montage, uh, a lot of experimental films that can be also considered slow films uh, can be characterized by a very distinctive durational style centered on the long take, okay? So this kind of aesthetics again is, uh, or style is usually conveyed uh, through a prevalent and common use of the long take and the focus, which allows us to focus on duration rather than anything else, okay? There's also little editing involve, involved, which gives rise to uh, a unique contemplative spectatorial practice, okay? So again, we are supposed to dwell on the image. We're supposed to contemplate the image, okay? Rather than, follow the story, 
right? Or follow whatever happens on screen. And usually very little happens. So there's really little to focus on in terms of uh, the narrative, okay? And all of this uh, highlights the aesthetics of emptiness and quietude, okay? So a lot of these films are actually very quiet and they seem to be pretty empty because also the setting is very restricted, okay? And on the level of the narrative, a lot of these films uh, actually present and kind of highlight uh, real life everyday locations, okay? So locations that are oftentimes neglected by, uh, by mainstream or independent films. Um, and also they, ha they have a very specific non-narrative structure, which is usually very simple uh, and open-ended, okay? So in this way, it's also open for interpretation. This kind of non-narrative structure also lacks a conventional meaning or clarity, okay? So at some point we can feel kind of lost, okay? We don't know what is going on and it is our role to figure out, okay, what the message is, if any. And as I mentioned, a lot of this, the, these films are also very realistic or even hyper-realistic. And it's a very specific type of realism. It's usually a documentary and sensory realism. So a kind of realism that appeals directly to our senses, okay? We feel as if we are placed directly in this narrative as a setting, okay? Uh, so it uh, allows us to kind of to feel the presence of whatever is depicted on screen. And finally, a lot of these films actually um, uh, are actually devoid of a clear cut kind of uh, ending or climax or resolution. Um, so instead, uh, they end on a kind of an ambiguous note, okay? The ending, if it does occur, but usually, well, every film ends, right? Um, obviously, but this ending is usually kind of pensive, which means, you know, melancholic, okay, and again, it places us in a thoughtful relationship to the image, right, we need to, we need to find out ourselves um, what the meaning of it is, okay, and whether we consider it to be important, or relevant, or interesting, at least, to some extent. Okay, and, and now I'd like to um, end my presentation with um, quoting Scott McDonald, uh, who's one of the most distinguished, prominent um, uh, scholars and writers um, mostly involved uh, in uh, studying the history of avant-garde and experimental film and video. And in one of his books published in 1993, uh, Avant-Garde Film, uh, this book was published by Cambridge University Press. He made uh, an interesting statement uh, that did not originally refer to slow cinema, but it does actually uh, fit well into the context of our discussion. And um, he said um, the following, the goal, right, of films like this, okay, is much the same, okay, to focus um, an almost me mediative level of attention, okay, to focus our, our attention on subject matter normally ignored or marginalized by mass entertainment film, and by doing so to reinvigorate our reverence for the visual world around us and develop our patience for experiencing it fully, okay? And a statement um, like this, applies um, not only to slow cinema, but also to eco cinema, right? Um, so uh, with this statement, I would like to uh, finish my presentation uh, and also uh, like to say that I hope I, I, I encouraged you to, um, to uh, look at um, a, at least some films that can be um, seen as exemplary of the slow cinema tradition uh, because it really helps us uh, relax and unwind and, uh, you know, simply consider many different things that we don't really give much thought in our everyday life, okay? Um, so, um, again, thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot for being here with me. If you do have any questions or comments, uh, you can contact me at this email address. Um, 
um, uh, you, you can contact me anytime, anywhere, okay? Uh, and I will be happy to answer any of your questions or address any of your comments, okay? Um, so um, have a good rest of the day and uh, enjoy some other events offered here at the festival, especially those offered by my colleagues uh, from the Faculty of English. Um, so um, thanks again, and hopefully uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. Take care.